Yeah. Hello, hello, Izumi Faithful. Welcome back to another one of our Izumi casts. Over here is, of course, my all-so-stuck-up self, Nick Izumi. <laughs> and coming in from the great state of Michigan, over the Skypes, we've got... Archimides! Back together again to talk about that oh so new classic Haruhi Suzumiya. You could call it the continuation of Haruhi Suzumiya. Next, shouldn't you be calling it the downfall of Haruhi Suzumiya? Uh, okay, that's probably much more fair. This is for a lot of us, myself included, where the series started to fall apart for people. This is probably one of the most anticipated seasons of any TV anime that I've well, at least in my recent memory. Um, we are, of course, looking at The Melancholy of Haruhi Suzumiya Season 2. Mm-hmm. And we are going to be going over all of that goodness, uh, including its surprisingly strong opener, the infamous Endless Eight, <laughs> and the season finale that left me more dumbfounded than almost anything that I've seen recently. And that one will be a really fun topic for us because we have not heard anyone talk about that last story arc. Our best guess is that they didn't make it through the endless eight. <laughs> so let's get going, shall we, Archimedes, with uh... Bamboo Leap Rhapsody. So to start out, when we kind of come back from our little break from Haruhi, we join up chronologically before the end of season one. Just a, a little ways, I forget after which story arc it, it actually takes place in, but it, it's during an event called Tanabata, which is a Japanese holiday to mark constellations in the sky, essentially. And I apologize, I'm just not very well versed on uh, that particular holiday. The, the group is going to get themselves a tree and that they're going to make wishes. And the wishes compose of uh, what would you like to have uh, 16 years into your future and then 25 years into your future? And so uh, from there she has the group, you know, make their wishes and then uh, they kind of end the day. And uh, it, it was, it's, it, it's a, definitely an interesting moment because um, Haruhi starts thinking about um, what she kind of wishes for and what she wished for. Um, this, of course, all ties back to an event three years prior, which we will get to in just a second. But uh, Haruhi had uh, a very pivotal moment in her past uh, related to Tanabata, as our main, our main character, Kion, will soon find out. So, of course, with something as down-to-earth as soul-searching and, you know, character development through something like that, you would only expect a series like Haruhi to take it into the realms of weird, and weird it takes us, <laughs> because it's time for some time travel. Yep. For the, uh... Hue, Hue, Huey Lewis on the news. Yeah, da, 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 da. Okay, I love that movie. Anyway, <laughs> um, Mikuru uh, takes Kion aside uh, before everyone kind of leaves for the day, and, uh, to take him back in time. Um, he, of course, you know, is decently excited, I'd say, to time travel, though he's, in his very Kion-like way, he is always kind of pessimistic at the same time. Um, but basically, uh, Mikuru sits him down, uh, and he just kind of conks out, and it's past. Yeah, the next thing you know, he goes back in time. I thought that was a pretty cool move, making uh, making the actual time travel kind of mysterious that way, rather than, mm -hmm. you know, being really overt about it. I really enjoyed that. Yeah. It's classified, after all. <laughs> of course. Of course. And uh, so he wakes up. Uh, he's lying in Mikuru's lap, actually, um, in uh, on a park bench kind of in the middle of town. And uh, it's about that time where Mikuru actually falls asleep herself. And uh, 
but at, right after telling him that they've transported them themselves three years into the past. That's of course when a uh, big Miss, <laughs> Miss Asahina shows up, uh, the Asahina from the future that we saw in season one, mm -hmm. who tells Kion that she has to, he has to go and meet up with someone uh, and do what they say. I wonder who. I wonder who that could be. <laughs> For those of you who might remember some of the weird stories from season one, you might have heard about that Haruhi has always been weird. So, of course, it's time for teenager to Kion to meet up with middle schooler Haruhi and <laughs> hijinks ensue, for lack of a better. <laughs> yeah, Kion, uh, he has to carry the sleeping uh, Mikuru on his back, but he does, he stumbles across a girl, a young girl breaking into the, the school. <laughs> and uh, it turns out, of course, that it's Haruhi Suzumiya, uh, who's just as fiery and hot-tempered and demanding as her current self. Um, and over the course of this, she uh, gets Kion to draw a bunch of symbols on the lawn using the, the uh, foot, or the like baseball chalker. Continuity! <laughs> Continuity! Which uh, I, I will point out uh, some of the, the promo marketing that they had for uh, this season had live action versions of this scene kind of taking place with uh, characters in the distance lining chalk out spelling symbols from like security cameras and uh, and so after spelling out this message which specifically says I am right here Kiona and, and little Haruhi kind of sit down and chat a little bit where she asks him all about sorts of things like you believe in aliens and whatnot and definitely some of those kind of uh, paradoxical kind of conversations that ultimately lead up to some future events, I'm sure. Even though we have the weirdness here, it was a really kind of nice soul-searching scene. Mm -hmm. And as creepy and pedotastic as the Japanese fan base could be, I was so happy that this, for me at least, I didn't feel like this episode went there. It was more like just this young person meeting up with this older person and having that you know, that soul-searching moment with them that I, I think a lot of people have had in their life. Yeah, definitely. And, and from there, uh, one, one of the big drops that uh, I think in the timeline that happens is Haruhi recognizes Kion's uh, school uniform. And it, it's but we can kind of infer that... Uh, uh, that her decision to go to North High, as it were, may have stemmed from this meeting up with Kyung. Every wobbly, timey wimey. Indeed. So with that, uh, little little baby Haruhi just jets off, leaves him there, and uh, it's about this time Ikuru wakes up to find out that her TARDIS pretty much is gone. <laughs> she can't get back to the future. So. Um, they decide to uh, go meet up with some of the other people that might be able to help, specifically with Yuki, who, of course, is always there to save the day. Uh, this was another example of the show actually embracing its full sci-fi elements to just a weird enough extent that it was still fun. Because uh, her resolution is essentially uh, cold sleep. I mean... Well, suspended <laughs> animation, really. Yeah. She she puts them in essentially like stasis in like the be in the bedroom in her apartment for three years. <laughs> and uh, and then, you know, she just wakes them up one day and it's the present again. Um Sean of course asks about the weebly wobbly timey wimeys, but uh she's like you can't you can't understand. I, I remember that they, they explained it well enough that I was willing to smile and just let it go. Like, it wasn't like new Doctor Who writing where I just get angry at it for being so <laughs> intensely stupid. Um, um, well, one last thing that I want to mention here, uh, like I said, this was a really fun kind of soul-searching episode, but one of the things that we do learn about one of our characters is uh, Mikuru herself. Uh, she kind of reveals that she's 
kind of just an intern uh, in the context of the time agency <laughs> uh, that Haruhi caught her one day. Like she wasn't attached to whatever Haruhi project, if you want to call it that, at all. It's just Haruhi caught her. And so she got pretty much uh, stuck with the job of making sure that Haruhi gets what Haruhi wants. Which is a really interesting uh, aspect to her character. It gives you a, a better pers perspective to, to go from on why she's, you know, necessarily so ditzy and uh, seems to never have any idea what's going on. <laughs> she's not very high up on the, the proverbial food chain, as it were. This is another weird episode for me in that, well, as I kind of implied, I really enjoyed this one. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went into this season, like, this. it had already been out for a while by the time I had gotten to see it. Oh, yeah. And uh, there had already been all sorts of hype, and I had heard all sorts of good things, bad things about it, mostly bad things. And it was one of those times where I admit one of the bad habits that I have is that I will go into something after hearing a lot of bad feedback, and I'll think to myself, well, I'll, I'll see if these people are right. Maybe they're being too judgmental, and... And then I'll be like, well, it's, that's not as bad as people said. And I'm going to lose all my credibility because I'm because it's I, that was what it was for me with Quantum of Solace. That's what it was for me with the second season of the Subasa anime. Like people were like, oh, this isn't that good. And then I go in, I'm like, you know, I, I didn't think it was that <laughs> awful. I was I actually kind of enjoyed that. And I was I went through that episode. I'm like, well, oh, that was pretty good. Maybe this infamous Endless Eight won't be that bad. <laughs> No, I know exactly what you mean. Like the, uh, there was so much hype and uh, publicity about this season, and uh, I, like this first opening episode, it had such a great classic Haruhi charm to it. Uh, it was whereas, a really strong season opener. Oh yeah, it it was great, and um, and, and within the the chronology again uh, compared to the first season. If you notice, uh, during season one, after we have a time skip, there's suddenly a tree in the background of the the club room. Well, that's the tree from this episode, and uh, it it's one of those kind of connections that's just kind of neat that they they have that kind of foresight and uh, make that connection for you. Uh, is one thing that I really liked about uh, season one, and uh, was kind of finding out all these little things like why is the the club room different now and it's like oh okay so there's this story attached to that and uh, but yeah so the little things were really what made that first season like as fun as what it was and i was hoping for more of that with this s strong season opener mm -hmm. but then and things so, so the next next story arc uh, of 3 is, of course, the Endless Eight. The infamous Endless Eight. The infamous Endless Eight, which I will about... I'm, I am going to sum up for you in eight seconds. Uh, wait, what? I can sum up the whole thing in eight seconds. Archivize, we promised people a throwdown of the Endless Eight. We'll, we'll, we'll do a little bit of that, but here, here's the overall plot summary for you. Okay, so if I'm on the, I'm on the clock now, and Time start. Ends. Oh, ready? Ooh, hey. Three. And go. All right, Haruhi gets the group stuck in a time loop where they relive the last two weeks of their summer vacation until they realize they didn't get their homework done, and then they do it. Wow, you That's could have, the NSA. You could join the Fine Brothers. That was such a good read. Whoa. <laughs> that is essentially the plot of The Endless Eight. Eight episodes where the characters relive the same two weeks. Groundhog only, Day all over again. Yes. So, uh, should have done the math beforehand, but how? that's eight, ep eight episodes of about 24 minutes each where the same thing happens, uh, nearly identical for the first half of it, and then semi-identical for the second half of it. <laughs> 
No, I'd almost say, like, the first, like, uh, okay, so the first time through, it seems like just a, a mediocre Haruhi episode. Like, just an okay episode. Yeah. Then you get a second episode where you're like, oh, oh, go, oh God, something is horribly wrong. Mm-hmm. And then they do it a third time, and they kill all of the tension. It's over. I mean, I know a lot of people get upset with this story arc, because it's repetitive, but, I mean, that's really it. There's not even that much to get upset about. I, <laughs> It's just... Yeah. It's repetitive. It's very repetitive, and, like, I can explain, like, some of the things that they do. Like, they, they go swimming, they go to a bond festival, which is a big uh, Japanese event. Uh, they catch bugs. Um, they, they get jobs where they get a frog suit. So, again, the frog suit that you see hiding out in the at the end of season one, uh, that's from this set of events, and uh, and st they go stargazing. Uh, stargazing actually is one of my favorite moments of each version of the episode, because uh, Haruhi's just kind of being chill, and usually by then the group is kind of <laughs> depressed and uh, musing, and and there's always a, a scene where Kion is talking with. Uh, Koizumi, and Koizumi is being really, I don't know how to describe uh, Koizumi in this season, he's hes different. He seems but, really dark this season. Yeah, but sinister, almost. The, the thing with this whole season, though, I, I, I mean, I shouldn't say this whole season, the thing with this whole story arc, though, is that, I mean, people blow it out to be really bad. And don't get me wrong, it is. I just, I don't know. I like, I still want to hate on it, which yeah. is weird because it it really is a waste. It it is a waste of time, and and I thought it was, it it's still uh, ironically kind of meta. Like I like I was still able to pull out some of those very abstract uh, ideas that I think they were going for, and I I thought it was hilarious when. The solution they come across that Kion just blurts out was, I haven't finished my summer homework. Like, he just yells that in, in the middle of a cafe. And they had, like, one day left to finish it. And, uh, and Which so they could all have been together. a really yeah. funny finale had they not overstayed their welcome as much as what they do. Yeah, but I thought it was hilarious that they're like, I haven't gotten my homework done. And I couldn't help but think, I haven't gotten my homework done because I've been watching this show. <laughs> <laughs> like, I and, really feel for the people who watch this as it was coming out, who don't have the option to, you know, fast forward or skip, or like, we're just waiting for a new episode every week, and then they just kept getting burned. And like... Yeah. If you, I, I go ahead. Oh, no, I, I was going to say, if you watch it, if you even watch, like, the DVD release... You can literally skip the second disc and lose absolutely nothing. That's why I'm I'm pretty sure like uh, they released the first season in individual volumes, though they kind of box them up um, in the U.S. Anyway, mm -hmm. I think they right away they the were only selling a box set of season two. Yeah, the U.S. release had an only box set release, and I'm certain this is why. Yeah, I'm positive of that, too. Because there was so much negative hype behind it. And you can't blame people for being upset, because there were some interesting concepts here, but they overstay its welcome. And it's not even like, uh, like in Bill Murray's case, he got to, you know, be a better person. And in, you know, in Star Trek's case, they got to meet Frasier. But at the end of this endless loop thing, it just goes on for so long. Both, ran the, both the episode of Star Trek Next Generation I'm referencing and the movie Groundhog Day are over way faster than this is. Yeah. I, I will say, like, uh, a couple of things of note, kind of going back to plot things. Um, one of the, the big things is that Yuki actually kind of, since she exists outside of time, essentially, if you want to call it that, She's remembered every single loop that they've gone through. And by the end, uh, they were at 15,532 loops through the last, for the same two weeks. 
I don't know if you want to say, well, at least we didn't have to watch all that. But, you know, it, it's not really consolation. It's it's the it, it's it, an interesting concept that I really don't feel like they ran with. It's um, to compare yeah, it, it to another TV show that did almost the same thing, like in, uh, in Doctor Who, uh, they mentioned that Rory Williams has been remembers all of his years from being a plastic man and being alive for 2,000 years, and after they bring that up, they never bring it up again in the entire series. Mm -hmm. It's really frustrating. And, yeah, and, like, it also, like, that fact alone really introduces a big plot hole for me, um, because we've established by now that Yuki will pretty much do anything Kion says. Mm -hmm. Like, she always just kind of goes with what he tells her to do. Um, so at no point does he say, Hey, Yuki, next loop starts? Tell us right away. <laughs> so we can, we can have the full two weeks to figure it out, rather than, like, one week down, and that's when they figure it out. That's the thing that we forgot to mention, is, yeah, every time that this loop restarts, none of the characters remember it happening. So... It's not just seeing the same events over and over again. It's seeing the characters discover that the events are happening over and over again every time. In the same way. In the exact is, same way. Which is Mikuru calling up Kyon in the middle of the night saying, crying, I should say, <laughs> that uh, she can't contact the future. <laughs> it's frustrating and stupid. So th there have been a number of defenses for this story arc. The, the mm -hmm. most noteworthy one that I've heard is that, well, the first season was trying to parody otaku culture, which I'm willing to take. I accept that. Yep. But their take on it is, well, this one is saying that people just keep watching the same junk over and over again, and it's trying to lampoon that. Maybe that was the goal. I don't know definitively if it was or not. But... If it, if it was, they succeeded. We hated it. Yeah, <laughs> it was... Uh, the same thing over and over again. It was like a big middle finger to the fans is what it felt like for me, anyway. It, it, like... Yeah. It, it felt like an active um, act <laughs> to split the fan base. Like, after season one, Haruhi was huge. It was everywhere. And it's like... Uh, we've got too many people. Quick, let's split them up. Let's get rid of half of them. Yeah, I, three quarters. I don't know what happened. I don't know if it was like, uh, like we were talking about at one point, the fan base for Haruhi was so devoted. It was cult-like. And I almost have this image of Kyoto Animation being like, you know, we could do anything we wanted to and just run with it. <laughs> Well, I mean, let's just make the same thing eight consecutive times, and I bet people will still stay on board. Uh, that was not the case. Though, I will say, as, as we are on defenses, I will say, in the defense of the episodes, this was not a cop-out animation-wise, by any means. No, they, they did new animation in each and every episode. Each and every episode uh, still looked fantastic, different camera angles, different costumes for all the characters, or outfits, if you were. Um, yeah, it, like, they but didn't it, on that. Um, but at the same time, I guess, I, it, it almost feels like more, from, from my perspective anyway, when I see a lot of these things as, you know, lampooning the fan base, that just to me seemed like going more out of their way to spit on the fans of, you know, oh, you little perverts, you want more... Uh, outfits on the characters to have your fun to here we go here's oh, all sorts of stuff man. so that in a nutshell is the endless eight and i did one well, my last comment was um as i mentioned before i've been reading the light novel in the the light novel is one of three stories mm -hmm. i believe it's three in uh the third or fourth book, The, the Rampage of Haruhi Suzumiya. And it lasts from page 3 to page 57. And it covers one time through all this stuff. So it, it, it starts with Kyon uh, living the last week, essentially. Now, and it's done. 
No, you know, I, and I know a lot of fans got really upset because it seemed like a poor way of adapting that story, and we can agree, and there's everyone and their brother has done their sound and fury about this season. Yes. And we even did our own right now. <laughs> Here's the thing that might shock all of you people who are listening. As much as neither Archimise nor I liked The Endless Eight, and we neither of us liked it, I... I, I think, Archimise, I think you're willing to give it a bit more artistic merit than I am, but, um... Do the whole thing about two, three times now. Yeah, <laughs> I don't want to again. <laughs> so you, you've, you've probably devoted more time to it, and I understand... I've done my time. <laughs> you, you have done more than your time, my friend. But, uh, like, as, as much anger as we direct towards this Endless Eight story arc, we actually hate what comes next way more. Oh, yeah. Yeah, um, so we're done with that. That's all we have to say for The Endless Eight. Let's get to the real meat of our, just, where we feel like this series just died. So, with that, we start the story arc called The Sigh of Haruhi Suzumiya. If you may recall, episode zero from season one... How could you is, not get it? <laughs> yeah, is uh, this kind of amateur film that the, the characters made. Um, over the course of, you know, one of the stories. It is, in fact, this story. So we get to see them film their movie, which starts out, you know, fine enough. It's hard. He pulls them in one, one day after uh, they've, the classrooms have kind of divvied up what their projects are for the, the festival, uh, the school festival. And, uh, of course, Haruhi's completely unsatisfied with anything that the school could come up with, so she decides, hey, let's make a movie. And it's extra fun because, like, she comes up with the, the story for it in her head, and, of course, she scripts pretty much all the characters as they are. So Koizumi is playing an esper. Um, Mikuru is playing a time-traveling waitress slash bunny girl. Yuki is playing a witch, though I, I forget if... She included the alien. She's an alien, alien space witch. She actually is alien. alien. And uh, and Kion is uh, everything else. <laughs> I think that's how he's listed. He's like cameraman, uh, effects he, editing. He never gets in front of the camera. He's just uh, he's just there recording everything. Yeah. So we know how the movie turned out. We got to watch it in all of its awfulness in episode zero. Mm -hmm. But we find out all of these hijinks kept... Ha we just keep getting these situations of what could have been a fun situation, which is Haruhi wants special effects to happen, and they start happening except for real. Some of them are, are decently fun. Uh, for instance, Haruhi like, wishes Mikuru could shoot lasers out of her eye, and so uh, when they're filming one scene... She's got, like, a contact in, and she actually launches this laser out of it. Uh, you can't see it, of course, because it travels too fast. Uh, Real might, lasers! Real laser! You might recall a scene, like, where the camera went black in the in episode zero, and then all of a sudden Yuki, like, had charged across the, the map and tackled Mikuru. Um, that was because, like, she had to catch the laser, which would have shot Kion right through the face. <laughs> like, like, that is kind of fun. Um, but I, I will say, like, so much of this filming, and, and we're, we'll get into it more, is, uh, I, I kind of titled the arc as, like, uh, it's this, the humiliation of Mikuru. Like, how he makes her, uh, walk around town dressed as a bunny girl, dressed in a, a maid outfit, where the skirt, like, goes maybe halfway down to her knees, Mikuru's been mistreated in the show. Like, no one would deny that. Yeah. But now we get into the stuff that there is just no forgiveness for, as far as I'm concerned. It, it's very exploitative. And, and the, the thing with her, her character is, like, she looks miserable throughout the whole arc. Mm -hmm. She's always crying and just looks so depressed. Like, no one is having fun filming this except for Haruhi. Um, which is, I guess, normal. It's, it's normal, but at the same time you have 
the characters start acting in a way that makes them completely unappealing. And I think this is where the series started falling apart for me, is that it, we are kind of used to everyone just goes along with Haruhi's BS. Like, that just happens, and they kind of s sigh and get it over with. But maybe I was just in denial about it, but it wasn't until this story arc that it felt that I felt like it was so overtly how much it didn't seem like the the cast members cared about each other's well-being at all. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I got the feeling from the first season that it was still kind of an ensemble show and that despite their weirdness that these characters had become friends throughout this weirdness. Oh, yeah. But in this, I don't feel that at all. It's not just that they, they're not friends, it's that they have no desire to look out for each other, period. Like, uh, Kion manages to recruit his, his buddies, uh, Tanaguchi and forget the other guy, uh, Kunikita. Right. And, and uh, Susuria, uh, Mikuru's friend, shows up, and they, they be zombies for some of the scenes. And, uh, and, and, and basically, like, the, the plot of, well, you probably remember the plot from Zero, is essentially, like, Mikuru versus Yuki. And Haruhi is, uh, he, she actually hasn't, like, written out a script for them. She's keeping it all in her head and just telling them to do things on the fly. And, and of course, you know, that is perfect for everything going according to her whim. Because that's where things really just get, get, because we get some other weird stuff. We get, like, a talking cat for a little bit, and that was like, oh, okay, that's kind of amusing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but, like, the, the fun, this is really the point where we stop getting fun, real lasers and talking cat. This is where things start getting fracked up. Yeah. So, uh, kind of coming back, um, like, one of the one of the scenes they film is with Mikuru getting tossed into this really crappy water. It, it's not it's not a pool, and it, I don't think it's a lake, but uh, everyone's got trash in it, and it's like freezing cold water. Anyway, she gets tossed into it, and so uh, they go to Cecilia's house so that she can kind of clean up, and Haruhi wants to film the next scene because apparently Cecilia's family is uh, probably mafioso. Like, they have this huge house. Um, they're, they're, they're loaded, if anything. Yeah, they, they've they got, you know, ginormous house. Old-fashioned old Japanese style, too. And, um, and so one of the things uh, that happens is uh, Haruhi decides the, the, to film the scene where Koizumi uh, had taken Mikuru's character back to his place uh, after this battle. And the uh, to, to film this one scene, like, Haruhi wanted uh, a, a love scene, essentially. Of course, she has no idea what she's doing. Uh, she just demands that it happen. And, uh, and one so thing... So that's to, awkward in and of itself. Like... Uh, of, co of course, especially with Kion always hearing his uh, inner monologue, like, uh, of course he's, you know, perverted high schooler in his own right, a perverted male high schooler, I should say, and, uh, and, and of course he's always over, or, or he's just dramatically acting every time Koizumi and, like, Mikuru are getting close and, and one, or anything happening to Mikuru, honestly, mm -hmm. and, um, and, uh, I do want to say right before this scene, uh, Susuria had brought out drinks for everybody, like milk, essentially. And, um, and Haruhi actually told her to put some sake into Mikuru's drink. Uh, to quote-unquote, like, uh, put her in the mood to kind of let her relax a little. Of course, uh, Mikuru is a complete lightweight when it comes to alcohol, and, and more importantly, this is what we call date rape. Yeah. So I, I'm just, sorry, I'm not going to dance around the issue. This is just yeah. She she's pretty much roofied. Um, you know, whatever it is, if it's a drug and it causes you to lose your inhibitions, yeah. So, with Miku <laughs> being. So, uh, Drugged. <laughs> Where the audience should be completely offended and horrified. Haruhi is telling Koizumi to, like, get in close and, 
and you know just kiss her on the face and everything and this really solidifies Koizumi and, and what you were saying earlier Nick mm -hmm. about no one caring about each other Koizumi is a complete yes man he doesn't want to upset the order so he is full on board for doing whatever Haruhi wants to Mikuru he will do it he, he has no opinion of his own and I'd say suddenly, filled with the righteous anger of himself and those sitting at home, Kion finally steps up, and he gets ready to slap Haruhi right across the face for her insanity. Of course, we should comment, he actually wasn't going to slap her. He, he had a bald fist, and... Oh, yeah, okay, uh, let's be fair. We, we only know this because uh, Koizumi actually stopped him, he grabbed his wrist... Like, Kion is just sitting there, arm raised, just about to hit her, and, and Koizumi is hanging on to him. I will say, I'm, I don't know how he got on that side of Kion, like, spatially. Anyway, um... Another yeah. problem with this episode. Um, <laughs> <laughs> a significantly so, less important one, but a problem nevertheless. And so, Haruhi and Kion start arguing, and, and Kion, um, you know, it is bringing up the right things, like, you know, how can you do this to someone? It's like, what are you doing? And Harry's like, what do you mean? I'm the director. Everything, uh, you know, just do what I say. I, I put down some quotes. Uh, Joan yells out, you know, Miss Asahina is not a toy. Mm -hmm. In response, I can treat her like a toy if I want to. That's what Haruhi says to him. Um... And so, yeah, Kion wants to smack a person. <laughs> he, he, he looks like he wants to just knock her out. Um, and, and don't get and me so wrong, I don't normally advocate violence, but rightfully so. Mm. Uh, again, I'm just so horrified. I was absolutely horrified watching this at home. Because th this is... These are characters who, again, despite all of their quirks and such, I really felt like had become, you know, friends, had become, like, uh, a family of sorts. And here, it, here is this main character completely okaying the uh, roofing of an almost rape of another character and being shocked by the fact that someone would stand up to her over this. Like, the, the whole fiasco... Uh, kind of just goes down and and I think a drunken Mikuru like manages to you know no just blah, 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 classified and uh, Susuria actually kind of uh, steps in and says like no okay you know I'll, I'll take care of her <laughs> um, she apologizes profusely for the sake um, though she put it in on Haruhi's orders um, and, and so, like, everyone just kind of goes their separate ways um, for that episode. Uh, one thing to know, like, um, that it's kind of pointed out by uh, Koizumi as they're kind of uh, leaving. Like, Haruhi, I forget where she even goes. I don't think she stays there, but she doesn't leave with Kion and, and Koizumi and Yuki. Uh, but Koizumi points out to him is like Haruhi always expected Kion to be with her through everything that she did and so now that he's taken such a vehement stance against her has really uh, unsettled her um, yeah so all of the characters are taken aback by this and we have another episode where Kion is understandably soul searching Mm -hmm. You know, trying to figure out where his life went so horribly wrong. <laughs> yeah, and uh, it's just kind of concluding the, the episode, not the arc just yet, but uh, it's like the next day, Kion is eating lunch with uh, his two buddies, Konakita and um, Tanaguchi, and... Uh, like, I believe it's Tanaguchi is, like, just kind of complaining about uh, how they kind of had their bit role in the movie and then uh, were cut out from the rest of the filming and everything. So he's just kind of complaining about it. And Kion, 
uh, gets really upset by that. Um, and, and, like, a big part of the dialogue is uh, Konakita is, or Taniguchi is complaining that, you know, what Haruhi's doing is crazy and stupid. And, uh, and on the other hand, Kion is like, well, at least she's doing something. Like, their class had opted to do, like, a survey. Like, mm-hmm. the, the simplest thing they could possibly think of that would require the least amount of work. And then they all complain about, you know, how boring and stupid it is. Um, so, in, in Kyun's mind, like, one of the big things that's happening is uh, he's kind of coming to that realization is that's kind of how he is with Haruhi and all of her adventures. Like, he, he goes along, like, he, he wanted something more interesting to happen in his life. And something interesting is happening, but at every turn, he's complaining about it and wishing that it would stop. And and yet he's having a, like he's enjoying it uh, is a big part of what he's coming to is like he he really likes uh, having these adventures and all this craziness. Uh, he he complains about it at the time, but he ultimately enjoys it. Um, Which would be reasonable if it weren't for the events that just unfolded. <laughs> yeah, that. Okay, so. To kind of wrap up the episode... This got me really angry, I'm sorry. No, it, it's completely justified. Um, to, as, as the episode wraps up, Kyun goes and confronts Haruhi. And we have the best scene, I want to say, almost in both seasons. And it lasts for half a second. And it's when Kyun kind of just bursts into the club room, doesn't even knock. Haruhi is sitting there, and she's trying her hair up in a ponytail. And as soon as he comes in, she lets it go immediately. And, and kind of puts on a, a grumpy face. Like, that moment expl- like told you everything that is going on in her head. Mm-hmm. Um, in in but, her weird form of remorse, I guess, if you want to call it. Yeah, like... She definitely has other problems, but one of one of them is, you know, how she understands her relationship with Kyun. Throughout the filming of the of the movie, um, you know, where, where she's been the director and everyone has to do what she says, Kyun's kind of constantly kind of been there questioning her the whole time. And uh and and it's she's been kind of off put by it. And uh and of course with the, the most recent events where he completely stood up against her, justifiably, we will say. Um, you know, it. she really had to stop and think, is like, how can I get him to like me again? And, and uh, like, I, I've, I've thought about this moment a lot, and, like, how it should have gone down is Kion, you know, comes into the room and is like, Harvey, we have to talk, you know, these are your friends. You know, they're here because uh, they in, in, enjoy your company, because they want to be here, and you are treating them like toys. They are objects to you. You don't even see them as people. What's wrong with you? <laughs> That's what should have happened. Something should have done. Something should have addressed this. But no. no. After the show has already gone there and made you completely uncomfortable. They sweep it under the rug. Kion bursts in the room and says, Haruhi, let's make the best darn movie ever. No! Wrong! You're wrong! Start over! It's done! That's where I was at at that point. I'm like, no, no, you done fracked up. There's no way of fixing this. It was so frustrating. You made every wrong choice. Oh man, it yeah, and so there's one more episode after that, <laughs> like like that definitely had a big climax to it. Not not gonna lie, um, uh, yeah, it, a climax it, of stupid, of stupid. Because there because that's exactly it. It's like oh well, I know that you just kind of almost had one of our friends raped by one of our other friends who's a yes man, and you got her drugged, and that's 
pretty much makes you a horrible, unforgivable person, uh, and you should probably rectify that, or I'm never, ever going to speak to you again. But no, instead, we just have... Let's make the best movie ever! Let's finish this movie, and it's like, oh, God. So, like, we mentioned a talking cat, and so that happens. <laughs> um, one of the, the side effects of Haruhi filming uh, this movie is uh, the lines between reality and the movie have been kind of blurring for her, mm -hmm. and so she wishes things to happen for her movie, and then reality kind of changes to accommodate that. Right. Like Mikuru's laser eye, and and stuff like that. Um, and so we have Michael McConaughey voicing a talking cat. That which was, is kind of awesome. That, was, that would have been... You see, I, I couldn't have fun with that, though, because at that point I was just so angry. And so... They, they wrap up the last couple scenes and spend, like, uh, Kion has to, like, put it all together within a night, uh, which, again, is a scene where uh, Haruhi kind of volunteers herself to stay behind and help him do it. Of course, she doesn't help, but it's, it's more time for them to be spending together. Mm -hmm. and, um, and the movie winds up getting finished. And uh, to kind of rectify everything, Kion has, I think Kion had the idea, it's like, we'll have Haruhi read off this thing, uh, which is the big disclaimer when the credits roll in episode zero. It's like, this movie is a complete work of fiction. <laughs> Nothing in it is real. And, uh, and yeah. One of the other things, like in this last episode, this is where it gets weird. <laughs> As if it wasn't already... Um, Koizumi and Kion uh, have kind of a, a midnight meetup where Koizumi just kind of wants to chat. And, uh, and Koizumi starts telling him how all these factions exist. Like, most of them that we know of, like the, his organization, the Time Travelers, and then Yuki's group and everything like that. That they're, and he lets us know that there are bloody battles going on behind the scenes, <laughs> uh, like surrounding uh, Haruhi and everything. Um, he and we don't see any of this. We don't see any of that. But he blatantly calls Mikuru a seductress, that she's there to keep Kyon's attention off of Haruhi. And hey! And yeah, like, he, he's pretty much saying, like, uh, that none of these organizations, like, right now, it's like a truce between them, that they are not at each other's throats. And it, it's just really weird. Uh, and of course, Kion is the guy that is, like, will be caught in the middle of all of this if anything goes down. And he, he's the every guy, he's not affiliated with anyone except Haruhi, and it's just got this super sinister vibe, and it's really dark, and, and it's, it's really and creepy. Koizumi just pretty much, he just kind of says, don't trust anyone, <laughs> and, and there's this great moment where Kion's talking with Yuki later, and, uh, and, uh, he asked her, like, well, what what's Koizumi talking about? And she's like, yeah, that's in her very Yuki style, like, which I can't emulate. Mm -hmm. um, like, yeah, all this is, you know, it's the truth that he believes, and uh, and uh, but you might not want to trust everything he says. And uh, and she's then of course she says, conversely, you know, you probably can't trust anything I say either. Will we ever find out what this means? Well, not in the anime, because we wasted too much time repeating the same thing over and over again and having a rape scene. Thank you, Haruhi. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I... Yeah. I'm not sorry. Frack this show. And so we, we kind of close out the episode with the, the festival happening, and I, I made a note, uh, I think this is definitely another meta moment 
where all the people that came to, all the students that came to see their movie, we, we get a shot of, like, their little theater screening of it, and it's just a bunch of guys with glasses sitting there like zombies. And so, yeah, the, the Haruhi staff take one last huge biting uh, slash. That doesn't even make sense. They take one last, you know, deep staff. cut. Yeah, into the uh, their audience yeah, before, right. before you know, waving while giving a big, big extended middle finger. Right, so that's how I felt. Yeah. And and actually, it doesn't like the episode isn't even over there. We get one last epilogue, which is uh, if you recall, at the end of the first story arc, um, we we had Kion kind of going on that one date with Haruhi where he's like, I'm going to tell her about, you know, espers and, and time travelers and everything. The, the really happy moment. Well, we actually are taken to that date where he um, is just sitting with her in the, the cafe that we've seen 800 times by now. <laughs> and, uh, uh, had to and say eight, didn't you? I did say eight. Um, and, and he starts, you know, going off and, and explaining everything and she's kind of going along with it for a while and uh, she's of course guessing right along and this is after their movie so uh, he's pretty much saying everyone is exactly as you cast them in your movie and she's like uh huh <laughs> and she, of course she explodes at him and is like don't, don't call me an idiot <laughs> um, and you know storms out of there so, unfortunately, that date didn't go so well. But, uh, yeah, that wraps up that story arc. Holy and man. that stupid season. So... No one be talking about this story arc. I... I, I guess it's, it's not a secret that I'm filled with a lot of vitriol toward this. I mean, yeah, I understand a lot of people didn't like The Endless Eight. It's repetitive, it's... It's, in my opinion, completely disrespectful to the fans that the show had garnered. Um, and uh, it, the time could have been spent probably on a more interesting part of the original light novels that hadn't been adapted. I recognize all of those things. Mm -hmm. But I don't think those are the principal failures of this season. No. This, this story arc, there's so much wrong with it from... So many perspectives. Uh, it is just one long abuse of a character. Uh, and we're, we're, we have to go along with it. Like, no one ever stands up to Haruhi until that moment when, God, yeah, she was almost going to get raped. And which is why, like, when we were talking about back in season one, you know, back then... <laughs> It was kind of all fun and games. This time around it is so dark because we re realize Haruhi would go through with it. And it's not just that no one stands up to Haruhi until that point. Like, if, if it were just that, then that might be good drama. What bothers me is not just that no one stood up to Haruhi, it's that someone stood up to Haruhi, and then the conclusion that the show wants to give us is that they were wrong to do that. Yeah. And, oh man, I had, had so many notes of, like, all the instances where, uh, I, I, I will say I think this arc is the most meta, uh, as far as, like, things that are, are happening, um, or, or, like, that the, the industry, uh, kind of experiences, and, and that's because I think, uh, the, the fact that the characters are filming up something, that it gives a lot of play for them to do that, um, to like complain about production timelines and and fan bases, <laughs> but like other things too. Like there is so much shaming of Mikuru in this, and like Haruhi calling her a toy, telling her I, I have another direct quote: "If your boobs are the only thing that's growing, you'll only appeal to a small fan base." And it, like I can so see much that being, it. I can see that being read as like you know a uh, critique of the audience. I can see that, 
but it doesn't... Mm -hmm. The way that they use it doesn't come off as a critique of the audience. It just comes off as that we have a lot of really bad people in this show, and the show does not want retribution on these bad people. It's almost condoning what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, it's, it's really miserable. <laughs> It is not a fun arc to, to sit through. Um, we met it earlier, um, and it's it's most prominent during this. Like uh, art wise, this arc is shot a lot of like backlighting, and what what I mean by that, the light sources behind the characters, and so their entire bodies are essentially cast in shadow, and uh, you know it, it, it's it gives a really gloomy atmosphere and uh, you know not fun to watch the the events that are happening on screen but it, it's just not very pleasant to look at because it's just this gloomy kind of uh, it's just very dark and but, we're and be, because they did that that almost that made me feel like they were trying to make that almost rape scene feel as uncomfortable as what it came out as but it wasn't played to discomfort in the end. I mean, in the end, everything gets condoned. A big thing that I, I felt throughout this entire season is, uh, again, this chronologically takes place uh, during, uh, like, somewhere in the middle of season one. And uh, specifically, it takes place before the, like, Live Alive concert which for me was like the crowning moment of season one. I loved that episode. And to have the characters be in such a position where they just uh, are at ends, like, like you were saying, Nick, that they're not friends. They are all kind of out to get each other, essentially, <laughs> or that every, it's every man for himself. Uh, kind of kills the fun that was in the first season, and maybe that that's what they meant to do. And if it is, I don't job. know why. Uh, but if that was what they meant to do, good job. Yeah, it. You it, retroactively this, killed something good. This season actually does make the first one less enjoyable, because you knowing that these events happened uh, before, like this moment of great companionship. Uh, it's like how they are too far apart from each other uh, to to make things work. It, it just doesn't make sense. And uh, and the other thing about the the season as a whole, and this kind of is a super overall complaint uh, about why it's not enjoyable as a season, is that it doesn't go anywhere. Mm. Uh, literally nothing happens. <laughs> uh, it, it's the the problem with making prequels is you have to end up, you, you have to start, especially with them where they start in the middle, so it has to start somewhere um, and be constrained by that, and then it has to end somewhere and be constrained by that. And either you have the route where you just don't care, which maybe gets you something like this, or you do care and you really restrict yourself. But ultimately, uh, we, we find out some new things, but at the end of the day, like, nothing new happened. Um, this, the status quo has not changed since the last time we saw these characters. It really makes me wonder if it's even possible, and this might be me just more generally projecting onto all media, but if it's even possible to make a prequel about a, in a character-driven genre. Like, in something that's actually focusing on on someone who's an actual character, can you make a prequel? Um, like, uh, you know, you could reference that technically um, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom was a prequel, but Indiana Jones isn't really a character. He's a male fantasy. Mm. Um, so, you know, that works because, of course, things are going to go right back to the status quo because the status quo never changes because he's Indiana Jones, he's a badass who punches Nazis, you know. That's mm. all there is to it. But... It's something like this where we had seen the characters grow a lot in that first season, 
and in any other thing where you have characters growing a lot in another season, I I just don't know if it can even work. I don't think I've ever seen a prequel, like one that actually focuses on like already well-developed characters, where the prequel has actually made things any better, and hasn't retroactively made it somehow less good for me. Yeah, and and I, I will I will also point out like the the Sai of Haruhi Suzumiya is actually the second light novel, um, so it came out right after the first one, which was that first like four or five episode story arc where Kion kisses Haruhi in the end. Um, so the like the next book after that was them filming this movie, and for the life of me, I can't figure out how the series kept going like if if that arc and it's pretty spot for spot uh with that one uh it's it's like how you know it, it's the worst arc that nick and i have seen it, it makes us angry and disgusted and, and it makes us hate the characters how did that be how could that be the second story and still have like eight, ten novels down the road. I, I can't fathom it. <laughs> well, okay, so we're both just dumbfounded by that, and I'm still dumbfounded by it. Let's uh, let's uh, take a look at this from a bigger perspective. Let's look at like I guess, you know, the marketing and the stuff leading up to this. Because I feel like, like like you said, you can't you can't figure out how the light novels kept going, and I can't either. Um, like it, and clearly they did keep going, but the same can't really be said for the anime fan base, at least not on the American side, which we've had experience with. Yeah. So, um, like, one of the big things was, uh, I think everyone was, but as we started the, the podcast with, like, everyone was, was excited for season two to come out. Everyone. And, uh, I forget, I should have brought up uh, like a wiki page on it like how it, did it come out two years after season one uh it yeah there was a long delay like there like there was a long delay between this season coming out there was an even longer delay uh for when the u.s release happened yeah and and i was um i was especially uh disappointed I guess I wasn't fully upset, just disappointed that it took them so long to get season uh, two out to us in the U.S. And because uh, it was a pretty long wait in Japan too, but then it was an even longer wait to get it in the U.S. And that's such a huge mistake. I mean, with with the huge fan subbing boom, I mean, Bandai Entertainment America could not have picked a worse delay on a product. Definitely. And, like, yeah, it was like two, three years, even in Japan. And um, and I will say, um, especially with the Endless 8 arc, I admit when I first watched this, I was a bit on my on a anti-fan-subbing high horse. And so I, I kind of laughed to myself when I thought of people, like, pirating this show and having to read all the subtitles of the Endless 8. Like, that was kind of hilarious to me. I, I, I'm i going to be entirely honest. I love the Japanese cast on this show, but I would not, I could not make it through the Endless 8 in the Japanese. I had to be able to do something else. Giving it my full attention was just... Yeah, so I, I apologize if, you, if that statement offends you, but I did find it hilarious that fans would were, like, extra miserable, miserable about it. Anyway... <laughs> Down from that high horse. Um, yeah, like, uh, I I had pre-ordered my... I, I knew I was going to get the DVD set, and I just decided to wait. And so, of course, you know, nearly a year passes uh, from when it was released in Japan. I want to say actually probably more than a year. And, uh, and then I finally get it, and I, you know, I was happy and then miserable. And, you know, like, what happened? Um, but yeah, like the, the release schedule was so weird and 
Uh, if I recall correctly, the disappearance of Haruhi Suzumiya, which we'll be covering in a future podcast, mm -hmm. uh, had come out before we got the English dub of Haruhi Season 2. It yeah. had come from Japan. And that was just kind of depressing because, again, then we had to wait for that dub. Uh, which took even longer, if I recall. Um, but yeah, it was it was just very dragging their feet uh, through so much, and and, and you know, you know, even uh, watching. Oh, Sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, even watching the fan subbers, though, it was interesting watching the enthusiasm for Haruhi just die completely. Because, like we said, the S A S O S Brigade, you know, this this was like a cult. Uh, in anime fandom, and then suddenly the Endless Eight happened, and everyone just stopped caring. Like, every, and like, all this vitriol was directed toward the series, but only at the Endless Eight. No one seems to get upset about the same things we got upset about. Just how bad the Endless Eight was, and suddenly liking Haruhi got a whole lot less cool all of a sudden. Oh, yeah. Fans started thinning out. It was weird. It was really weird. And, um, and yeah, it's, like, they, they had a lot of, uh, marketing pushes with, uh, live action, uh, stuff, which was just still really weird. And um, more embarrassing live action stuff, this time with, uh, Christina with, V? Yeah, Christina V, who's kind of a rising star in the voice acting community, um, mm -hmm. definitely I, I, made a big scene for herself, oh, sorry. Uh, I was going to say, I, I will say, I admit, I, I do enjoy her English version of uh, Super Driver, the new theme song. I liked her version more than the original, to be <laughs> entirely fair. Um, I, I, like, she's really talented. She's definitely been uh, a big part of the fan community, and people mm -hmm. really, she has, like, she had followers, um, and she had been doing fan dubbing. She was a really... Like, she was really big in the anime community. She kind of had a name for herself. I have a friend who was in the fan dubbing uh, um, circles, and, like, she was the kind of person who, like, before she was getting these professional jobs, which she has now, she was, like, involved in the uh, in fan dubs. Like, she was playing Ronka in a fan dub of Macross Frontier that never got finished. Hmm. Like, that kind of thing. So she was really big in the geek um, scene. So they picked someone who had actual, if you would, street nerd cred. Yeah. And, and yeah, they were, they were just kind of boring and stupid. Embarrassing. They, embarrassing. They were really embarrassing. They were, they, I don't know if those were more embarrassing than the ones that they did for the first season, but they were pretty bad. Yeah. But uh, other other things uh, production-wise, uh, I did like I will say uh, I, again, kind of what I was commenting on the end to say like uh, in uh, to Kyoto Animation still did a top-notch job animation-wise. <laughs> like the content was, was crap, but like the production quality was top-notch. Um, you know, animation was very fluid and, and awesome, though we did notice a little k kind of slipping in with the, the chipmunk face. Yeah, the, the character designs were changing really subtly. They weren't the same. They were very k looking, which was Kyoto yeah. Animation's other big moneymaker, which was Moe Bullcrap Girls Doing Girl Things show. I haven't seen k -On. <laughs> I... But uh, I, I'm not. I'm. I'm not trying. To, I guess I'm. I've never actually watched very much of it. It was not my cup of tea. It, it, but I'm not going to say it was like. It's not like Lucky Star where I actively hate it. <laughs> but it, it wasn't anything that I would like go out of my way to watch either. Yeah. But uh, other things like the the mood music is still great. Uh, it, it's still. They still really know how to get emotions going with. Um, music, uh, so so like that Koizumi meetup thing where he's talking about like backstabbing everyone. <laughs> um, it is set to like that film noir kind of music, um, 
which is a little brooding, but mysterious at the same time. Like, they still really got that. Um, uh, the, the back lighting where a lot of the characters are in shadow a lot was weird, mm-hmm. but uh, I guess, you know, it was consistent. <laughs> um, I, the, other, the other thing I, I do want to note, and, and this kind of ties in with uh, some of the other comments about this season, uh, and, and I guess this kind of makes me sound like a pervert too, um, the the camera, I I really picked up on. They really focus on Haruki's body in a really uncomfortable way. No, I don't think that makes you sound like a pervert. I think that you're noting the uncomfortable things that the show was doing. That's so, it's part of why I'm uncomfortable with Lucky Star. Is this weird sexualization of something that definitely does not look like it should be sexualized. So, like, the, the Endless Eight, one of the big things is they go swimming. Mm. Half, half of the episodes, uh, we get a very close-up shot of, like, Haruhi's body either swimming or coming up out of the pool and everything, like, full-on just kind of ogling her. And uh, in a way, it almost works like a, a lot of times we are coming from Kion's perspective, but... Uh, which I, I will note, when we are, the camera actually shakes a little bit, which is a neat touch. Um, but other times, yeah, uh, like for those that are, are curious, I guess, or, or who want to see evidence, watch the opening um, uh, of Super Driver, like the, the theme song and everything. The Right away, we get a scene where Haruhi like, gets up out of her chair and... Uh, and it's shot from behind, so we're essentially looking at her butt, and it's like animated very articulately how her body moves as she gets up. It was really weird. I don't know. That might just, just be me. I can just hear the amber alerts going off somewhere in the distance. Uh, so yeah, like this whole season was so uncomfortable. The. But, uh... Um, and, and like we mentioned like last time, like a lot of the uh, U.S. Fan, fans, a lot of the U.S. actors did not, did not seem all that psyched about working on the project to begin with. Um, I never really picked up on that there was that much excitement. Like they, it, it felt like they were making a much less of a big deal about who the cast was for the second season. Oh, yeah. Like, it was like, oh, yeah, the, the guys were, like the biggest question was, were they going to reprise their roles, like, because I'm sure they heard about the endless eight. It would, it would be like something um, where they would, like, decline because they didn't want to do the project. But, of course, if everyone knows Crispin Freeman's rant, uh, am I an actor? Yes. Do I need work? Yes. Will I say no? No. Exactly. And... It's just, it's one of those interesting, it was really interesting seeing that they were not making, the only, like, casting thing that I remember, they did make an announcement that they got the whole cast back, they made a big deal out of the fact that Christina V was playing a minor character, because again, they were trying to get that nerd street cred, but when it came to the marketing, like we said earlier, they did not sell this in individual volumes, which, by the way, the Japanese distributors absolutely hate when the American companies don't do that. They only put it out in a box set because presumably Ken Itayomi or someone at Bandai Entertainment was able to say, hey, hey. we're not going to make any money off this if we sell it in individual volumes. I'm surprised that it, like, they didn't pick up on that in Japan. I don't know if they did or not. But, like, I, I would not be surprised if... A marked drop in that disc where it's just endless eight episodes all the way through. You know, it's hard to say because, like, they in, something that people may or may not realize is that in Japan, they don't do box sets. Like, not for new shows, anyway. Like, mm-hmm. like box sets are things that they do. Like, right now, there's a Macross 7 box set that's coming out. But that's, like, because it's the 10th anniversary. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you, you, get an, you get a box set when your show has, like, aged a lot. You don't get a box set because the show just ended its season. So I would not be surprised if they did not put out a box set for this series. 
Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, and, as insane as that might sound. Yeah, there, and like coming down to it, um, there's not much more we can say about this season. Mm-hmm. It was, it was really bad. It started out strong. We had that great opener. We've had we had glimpses of like some of the the best characterization you could do. But again, like the the best moment lasted a a fraction of a second, mm-hmm. and, and that was something that uh, I, I thought the season one really did well, and I, I think I've commented on it before. Is like the Kyoto animation really knows how to use visuals to drive home ideas and themes. They don't have to bash you over the head with something, um, which you know. When they're not subtle, <laughs> they really bash you. Um, but yeah, it's it really it split the fan base. You know, I think. I really no- do think it's fair to say that this is when the this series single-handedly made the Haruhi fandom just die out. Mm-hmm. Can I have one last discussion point that I want to bring up though? Sure. Why do you think it is? that, like, when it comes to the rage directed toward this season, that all of it is directed at the Endless Eight. Like, it's... Like I said, I feel like no one else is, like, on our side getting upset about this bad last story arc. This offensive last story arc. I don't like, know. Um... I, like, um... The, the, one of the, the guys that was uh, in defense of the Endless Eight, I... Uh, we won't name and, but, uh, like, I kind of accepted it. I'm like, okay, you know, there's your discussion. I'm like, what did you think about the last arc? And he never got back to me. And, and that's just kind of been what I've seen is, like, even if you ask anybody, it seems like, oh, yeah, they made their movie and nothing happened. And ultimately, I, I can kind of agree, like, nothing, nothing of consequence apparently could have happened because... I saw one post on Tumblr about it one total post on Tumblr about it from someone who said something like that. And other than that, um, I just don't see anyone, like, getting upset about it. And I feel like, I feel like the Endless Eight is a waste. I feel like, and I'm not saying that anyone who was upset with the Endless Eight was wrong to do so. Because I've seen people say, well, it's wrong to get upset about that. I disagree. You should, I really, I, I'm not, I never say that fans are entitled to anything. Because bullcrap. You're not entitled to anything. But as a fan, it is also your duty to express that you want something better. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's that's why I didn't see the third Transformers movie. Um, it's why I'm not seeing the fourth Transformers movie. Because I don't want... To I don't support- want to support that. Yeah, I don't want to show that I enjoyed that and I want to actively say that these are bad movies and that this is bad and it's I'm kind of glad that the Haruhi fan base if if, if uh, Kyoto Animation really was thinking the way that I cartoonishly like to imagine them thinking like we can have Haruhi do absolutely anything and no one will be upset with us I'm glad people didn't accept that I just wish they would have gotten upset with the more the thing that was more worth getting upset about than it repeating itself over and over again. Yeah. Like, yeah. I, I think I think we've said it enough. Um, we've repeated ourselves yeah. enough. I hate, I hate. Would you say that we've done it eight times? Prob- probably more. If we haven't already, I can edit the uh, podcast <laughs> that way. That's the one. Just going to keep looping us forever, 15,000 times. Yeah, so, um, with that in mind, you know, as I said before, uh, by the time Season 2 actually got to our shores, the movie had been out in Japan, uh, and we would actually have to wait even longer to see that one. And can I almost make a bet, like, I hate to say it like this, and especially because, just to be entirely clear, I do miss Bandai Entertainment in America, and I feel like I've been ragging on them a lot, but... At but, that, the other as you were saying before, because they deserved a lot of that. But the the sad part about this release was that so many people had already seen it fan subbed, 
that no one was going to buy it at this point. Yeah. I shouldn't say no one was going to buy it, but they hey, were like, not going to get the same kind of numbers. They just weren't. Yeah. Yeah, it was... It was a bad time in the, the anime industry, and Haruhi Season 2 did not help at all. So this season uh, ended with, um, as as we'd say, as you can kind of figure, um, Arkhamai is, like, as you can even hear from just the way he's talking, like, really still looking for the merits. And, uh, again, I applaud you, my friend, for all of the work you've done just researching this show. Mike McConaughey was a cat. <laughs> I was oh, burned gosh. out. I was, after I finished the season, I was burned out. I didn't want anything more to do with the Haruhi franchise ever again. It was over for me. Um, I managed to stick with it. Uh, I waited. Um, once again, and, and I'll do one last plug against fan servers, that the possibility they always uh, seem to forget exists is that you could wait for a show to come out. Uh, is a virtue. You don't have to see it at that moment because uh, there's plenty more to watch. That's probably better. But uh, I, I waited for the English dub of uh, The Disappearance to come out and um, we'll definitely uh, return to that when we can. Um, but, yeah. Did, I, did the disappearance of Haruhi Suzumiya change my opinion of this franchise? Uh, was Brian, was, uh, or, or was <laughs> Arkhamai's, uh, great weight worth it? You're gonna have to find out next time. <laughs> Look at that. Yeah. We keep doing this cliffhanger thing, then we... Da -na -na, da -na. And guess what? Disappearance of Haruhi Suzumiya. I wonder if that's really meta, too. <laughs> Zing! Okay, well, have a nice night, everybody. Thanks for listening to us rant again. Yeah. Uh, Hopefully you learned something you didn't know about season two of Haruhi Suzumiya. And we look Other forward to <laughs> And we look forward to talking to you again when we finally close this thing off by reviewing the extraordinarily long anime film The Disappearance of Haruhi Suzumiya. Thank you. Have a good night, everybody. Bye bye. Keep on spocking in the free world. <laughs>